Assalamu alaikum. If everyone can please just find a seat and settle down so that we can go ahead and get started with the session. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. I'd like to welcome everyone to our session today entitled Radiating Beauty. My name is Iman Aliban and I'll be your hostess for tonight. We're very lucky today to have very esteemed panelists with us uh, to share their perspectives on both inner and outer beauty. Um, so what is beauty and how can we shape not only our hearts but our character and our actions towards that which is most beautiful. Speaking of beauty, a few um, housekeeping items. I ask that you silence your beautiful ringtones, please, uh, so that doesn't disrupt our panelists. And invite your beautiful children to please go um, to the babysitting area so that we can have, inshallah, the most beautiful environment today for our talk. And just so you know, we have evaluations passing around, so please make sure you fill those out and leave them, um, pass them forward before you head out. Inshallah, today we'll be starting with Sheikh Omar Suleiman. He's a world-renowned Islamic scholar from New Orleans. He's pursued traditional Islamic learning over the last 14 years in the UAE, Jordan, and Malaysia. In addition to becoming certified in various traditional sciences, he completed a bachelor's degree in Islamic law, accounting, a master's in Islamic finance, and is in the process of completing his PhD from the Islamic University of Malaysia. He served as the imam of the Jefferson Muslim Association in New Orleans for six years and was director of the Muslims for Humanity Hurricane Katrina relief efforts. He resides in Dallas, where he's a resident scholar of the Valley Ranch Islamic Center and teaches at Al Maghrib and Bayana Institute. Today, he'll be speaking to us a bit about how Ihsan with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will translate into Ihsan between us all. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sheikh Omar to the stand. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So you guys are probably not really thrilled to see me. The former president just spoke. I don't really have much to be here for, but alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Do you guys still have any energy in you? Okay, alhamdulillah. You know, I was, as we were talking, I was talking to Sheikh Abdul Nasser and Ustada Zainab about their topics, and you know, I thought that one thing that we could do is we could just introduce this entire topic of Ihsan. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Ihsan in the Qur'an, and when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi speaks about Ihsan, we tend to automatically take it to worship and we take it to ibadah. And I have to admit, when I first saw the program and I was like, all right, Ihsan in culture, it kind of threw me off a bit. How do we have Ihsan in art and Ihsan in beauty? Because the typical understanding, the traditional understanding of Ihsan is when the Prophet ﷺ was asked in the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam, when Rasulullah ﷺ was asked, Akhbirni an ihsan. Tell me about ihsan. And the answer of the Prophet ﷺ was what? And ta'budullah ka annaka tara. To worship Allah as if you can see Him. And even when you can't see Him, you realize that He sees you. And it's a very powerful concept. And it's one that if we were to implement in our ibadah, our ibadah obviously would not lack khushur, it wouldn't lack humility. If when we entered into our prayers, we understood that we're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He's watching us right now and it's as if I can see Him. Then how many of us would actually be able to delve off into different you know, realms and start thinking about our lunch and start thinking about our conversations and start thinking about our work if we actually understood that Allah azza wa jal was looking at us as we entered into that prayer. And that as Imam Al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala narrates, إِذَا دَخْلَ الْعَبْدُ فِي الصَّلَاةِ That when a person enters into, into his salah, ثُمَّ الْتَفَتَ And then he turns away. 
turns away, not physically, turns away spiritually from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قال الله عز وجل Allah عز وجل says to him, Ya Abdi, O my servant, إلى أين? Where are you turning to? إلى خير مني? Are you turning to better than me? Have you found something better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to work for? Have you found something better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to occupy your attention? Have you found something better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love to strive for? Where are you turning to? What are you looking for? Ya ayyuhal insan, ma gharraka bi rabbika al kareem. Oh man, what is it that has deluded you in regards to your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala? And so al-ihsan with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, showing excellence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a very powerful notion in and of itself when it, when it requires one to actually be able to visualize themselves standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as they would on the day of judgment. And as he said rahimahullah ta'ala, that the one who perfects his standing in this world will perfect his standing in the next world. But now how does that translate outside of the realm of salah, outside of the realm of prayer? And what does it truly mean in the way we hold ourselves and carry ourselves? In essence, what it does is it creates a consistent motivation. It creates a consistent drive. It, can, it creates a consistent sense of purpose. You don't lose ihsan after 40, 50, 60 years. Your ihsan only grows. Your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only grows. Hence, your drive continues to grow. And when people burn out in serving people, and subhanAllah, it's very interesting because studies show that, that people that volunteer, people that, are humani that, that work in, in the field of humanitarianism, that have a faith background, actually tend to last longer than those that, that, that work from a, a completely secular humanist background. Why? Because you know what? When you're volunteering and you're out there and you're serving the world and people are giving you all kinds of flack, and you're not being appreciated, it's very easy to burn out after two, three years and say, you know what, I'm not getting paid for this. Why am I doing this in the first place? But when you're doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for appreciation that the people cannot give you, your drive is consistent. And so it creates a beautiful character. It creates a beautiful drive. And it's very interesting because Imam Al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that there was a king that once told his children, he said, I love my general more than I love you. And they said, why? He said, anytime you tell us to do something, we respond. You tell us something, we do exactly as you tell us to do. We're obedient children. Why would you love your general more than you love us? And so he said, come with me. And they went out and he asked his sons for some water. And so right away they rushed to bring him water. And they walked for a little bit longer. And then he simply did this. <clears throat> He looked to a place where there was water and he didn't say anything. And so the general ran and went and fetched him water and he brought it to him. And he said, that's why I love him more than you. I didn't even have to tell him. He knew that I wanted it and he went out and got it. And he authored a very beautiful, it's, it's a very beautiful sentence, subhanAllah, it's very powerful. There's so much that's contained within it. He said, and hence in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, La uridu illa an urida ma yuridu. I don't want except to want what he wants. Think about how beautiful that statement is and how much is contained within that statement. I don't want except to want what he wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. I actually want my desire to be what Allah Azza wa Jalla desires of me. And so that drive would be consistent. And in essence, Ihsan, Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Ihsan creates two behaviors within a person. Number one, when a person sins and when a person disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're still talking about Ihsan with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one, he recognizes and he realizes, I love Allah more than I love disobeying Allah. And I love Allah more than I love myself. And if I love Allah more than I love myself, then I'm more interested in pleasing Allah than myself. Hence, I will abandon that sin. So that's his behavior when he commits a sin, when he disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then when he does a good deed, he tells himself, I love the praise of Allah more than I love the praise of the people. And so he's able to maintain ikhlas, he's able to maintain sincerity going forth on that path. And in the way he treats people, he doesn't always have to be thanked. He doesn't always have to be appreciated. He doesn't always have to be told good job and what you're doing is amazing because if you're that type of person that starts to crave the approval of people 
and the reward of people's acceptance, then you will simply sway to where they take you. And it's no longer going to be about principles and what's actually good for people. It's going to be about what's going to gain recognition from people. And so Ihsan creates that, that behavior within oneself where, you know what, I just want Allah to appreciate me. And when I disobey Allah, I realize I love Allah more than myself. So I will work harder to please Allah and not please myself. How does this transition from Al-Ihsan Ma'al Khaliq, showing Ihsan with the Creator, to Al-Ihsan Ma'al Khaliq, excellence with the creation? Interestingly enough, every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Ihsan in the Quran, Allah mentions it in the context of the way that you treat people. The most famous one, وَوَصَيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانًا And we have enjoined upon man and woman to treat his parents with ihsan, with excellence. You know, Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't just tell you in the Quran that we've enjoined upon you obedience to your parents. No, obedience is a given. Obedience is, is because you're human. That should be natural. It should be beyond birrul walidain. It should be beyond obedience. It should be beyond a ta'a or following them or, or listening to what they tell you to do. Allah Azza wa Jal tells you to honor them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you to, to pay attention to the details because in essence, as greatness is paying attention to detail, Ihsan is paying attention to the small things. Ihsan is paying attention to the details of the way that you treat people. And so when Allah tells you, treat your parents with Ihsan, Allah Azza wa is telling you to elevate it, to do what they don't expect of you. You know, Imam Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala, he said very beautifully, he said that it could be at times that you do something that is small for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you don't think too much about it. And because of that, Allah enters you into Jannah. Whereas you do something large, you do a huge good deed, but because you've thought about it so much, your intentions have been corrupted and that good deed is rejected. And I'll give you an example. If my four-year-old daughter, May, brings me you know, a, a heart from school that's cut out of construction paper that says, I love you, Dad and the D fell off and it just says, I love you, Ad. <laughs> All right? And draws a stick figure of me and I'm missing an ear and I'm missing a leg and I've got six fingers on one side and two fingers on the other side. That to me is more beautiful than a Picasso. That's the most beautiful art I've ever seen. Why? Because of the heart, and it might not be the heart, I mean, we tell ourselves it's the heart of a four-year-old, but just the thought that my daughter made this for me, the excitement in her eyes when she gave that to me, and every mother and father will tell you the same thing. You hang it up on your wall, you love it, you appreciate it. Likewise, it's the small things that you do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes that you don't even realize. Think about that man, the Prophet ﷺ said that a man entered into Jannah and was strolling in Jannah because he removed something harmful from the road. Do you really think he thought that as he was walking and he saw something harmful on the road, oh, if I pick this up, I will enter Jannah and the Prophet of God وسلم, is going to tell the Muslims about how he saw me strolling in Jannah and my name or my mention will be preserved in history. You really think he thought about it? No. He developed a character of Ihsan, a character of excellence. And so as he's walking on the road, he sees something harmful from the road and he thinks to himself, you know what? I should remove that so that it doesn't harm people. He didn't think too much about it. And that's the beauty of those small deeds that you do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you're walking and not cutting in front of somebody when you get to the escalator, not pushing someone out the way because Jimmy Carter's walking by. <laughs> I saw some of you in the lines. Some of you were about to get a little rowdy. Serving a glass of water as the Prophet said, لا تحقرن من المعروف شيئا Do not belittle any one of your good deeds because you don't know which one of them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to accept. So even serving a glass of water with a smile on your face, that might be the one. You might show up on the day of judgment and Allah looks at your salah, Allah looks at your prayer and you were distracted in every single prayer. And every single day of fasting, you had, a, back, you had a, a, a scene of backbiting or lying or saying something that was displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for one moment, you did something for Allah. And it was small and it was out of your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah takes that good deed. And as Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, if Allah wants good for you, Allah will take a good deed. And the Prophet said, Allah could multiply a good deed by 10, he could multiply it by 700 to whatever he wills. He will take a good deed and he will continue to multiply it until it dwarfs your sins just because he wants to enter you into Jannah. Because of the heart behind that good deed. That's Ihsan. Allah says, show that Ihsan to your parents. 
Give them a call when they don't expect it. Sit with them for dinner when they don't expect it. Give them gifts when they don't expect it. Ihsan with the way that we treat our spouses. You know, Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this is all part of creating a beautiful culture now. We're starting off with the individual, with the family, right? Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. One day as he was entering into his home, people used to make, Abdullah bin Abbas, I'm sorry. People used to make fun of Abdullah bin Abbas. You know why? Because before he would enter into his house, he'd start fixing his clothes up, start combing his hair, start spraying cologne, getting ready to enter the home. You know, most people, when they go home, what do they do? As they enter into the house, they just shut it all off, drop on the couch, and ask, where is the food? Toga, toga, right? S strange stuff, you know? Ironically, dressed down to a wife beater, what's called the wife beater, subhanAllah, just weird stuff. Ibn Abbas, عنه, as he's about to get into his house, starts combing his hair and getting dressed and, and looking nice. So the Sahaba used to laugh at him. And he said, listen, I like to look good for my wife just as I like her to look good for me. And he gives this beautiful analogy. He says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put a line. That line between you represents the rights that are to be fulfilled of each spouse. To be fulfilled of each spouse. If each one of us is claiming all of their rights, then you're standing at that line. And it's only natural that if you're a person who claims all of their rights, now don't don't take anything that I'm saying, don't misconstrue what I'm saying and saying that I'm saying that you should allow your spouse to abuse you, you should allow your spouse to do things to you because you should back off of that line. No, no. There are rights that need to be claimed and then there are days that you know what? You let a statement go out of ihsan. He's having a bad day, she's having a bad day. You let it go, a statement, something that you didn't like. Your spouse rolled their eyes at you. You let that go. He said that I don't claim all of my rights from her because I don't want to be at that line. Because I'm afraid if I go all the way up to that line that I'm going to cross over it. Instead what I do is I step back and I make sure that I fulfill all of the rights she has upon me. So that on the day of judgment that gap that's left over, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate. Meaning what? I always do a little extra for her and demand a little less from her. That's a part of faith. That's a part of my Islam. That's a part of my ihsan. That's a part of the way that I've been programmed by my religion, by my faith, by my Prophet wasallam to treat my spouse. Give a little bit extra. Take a little bit less. Because I'm seeking something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not just seeking instant gratification in this world in the form of physical gratification or emotional gratification. I want something more. And I will treat you with, 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 with even better behavior, with even kinder behavior than what's expected of me. And you know what's amazing about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? His seerah is full of the unexpected surprises to his spouse. He tells Aisha radiallahu anha, and one of the most, one of the things I adore about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you read in the history of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know people tend to change with their circumstances, right? When people are rich, they tend to be a little bit different than when they're poor. When people are suffering from oppression, they tend to be a little bit different. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes from being, you know, rich and, and, and healthy and happy to being poor and in poverty and boycotted and mocked, to being head of state alayhi salatu wasalam, and not rich but established. And his personality doesn't change. And so when he tells Aisha radiallahu anha early on, early on in their marriage, as they're going on an expedition, he says to the rest of the Sahaba, go, go ahead, go forward. And he challenges Aisha radiallahu anha to a race. Yes, our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would foot race with his wife and camel race with his wife. Later on in the seerah, once again, Rasulullah tells the Sahaba, hey, move forward. And once they're out of sight, he challenges Aisha radiallahu anha once again to a race. How many times did the Prophet surprise his spouse? How many times did he show that extra ihsan, that extra unexpected smile that wasn't expected of him? And that's the point. And when Allah talks about Ihsan in Surah Ali Imran, when Allah Azza wa says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Rush to the forgiveness of your Lord. And a paradise that is, more, that, that is more vast than the entire heavens and the earth. And it's been promised for the muttaqeen. Allah Azza wa Jal then describes the characteristics of Al-Muhsineen, people of Ihsan. And you know how he describes them? الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ 
Three things that solely relate to the people. A person who gives charity, whether he himself is in need or whether he's in ease. Meaning what? You know, when you go to a fundraiser, who does everyone look for? The doctors. I know this, I do fundraisers. As a fundraiser, you keep eyeing the doctors. And I don't know who you are, you keep looking at the doctors and you keep saying, Brothers, ittaqullah, fear Allah. How much money do you have? Give for the sake of Allah. I don't actually do that, but a lot of fundraisers do that. Focus on the doctors, right? But there's a person of ihsan that's sitting there. And that hears the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sees the pictures of people that are in need and is naturally driven to give even when it's not expected of them because they themselves are in need. And so Allah says, this person of ihsan, he will give even when he needs himself. And the second person, وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْثِ Those who swallow their anger. They swallow their anger when their anger is justified. It's easy to not get angry when you're, when you're in the fault, when you're at fault. But they swallow their anger when their anger is justified. They completely swallow it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I guarantee a home in the center of Jannah. لِمَنْ تَرَكَ الْمِرَاءَ وَنْ كَانَ مُحِقًّا For the one who leaves arguments even when he is completely right. Even when he's completely justified. Why? I'm not leaving it for you. I'm leaving it for Allah. I want that house in Jannah. I don't want Allah to be angry with me. I want Allah to give me. So there's ihsan with al-khaliq. There's ihsan with Allah that leads to the way, the, the ihsan in the way that they treat people. وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ And those who forgive and pardon people. Why? They can totally claim their rights. They can do whatever they want. But وَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ يَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Let them forgive and pardon. Don't you want Allah to pardon you? Don't you want Allah to overlook your mistakes? And Allah says at the end of this ayah very simply, وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And Allah loves the people of Ihsan. Meaning what? If you act in this way that's being mentioned here, in this ayah, you will gain the love of the people around you as well. But you weren't looking for their love in the first place. You were looking for the love of who? Allah. And so Allah assures you, Wallahu yuhibbu al-muhsineen. Allah loves the people of Ihsan. Allah loves the people of excellence. And you know, subhanAllah, I, as my time is running out, I want to just leave you with something very interesting. You know, the Prophet wasallam, one of the amazing things, because when we look at a culture of Ihsan, we see that the Prophet wasallam, always went above and beyond. He was always trusted even by his enemies, even as they were boycotting him, even as they killed his family members, even as they, he suffered, and even as he was trying to escape them, they had their valuables with the Prophet wasallam because they knew that they could trust the Prophet wasallam even when they did that to him. And the Prophet he honored that trust. He didn't tell Ali radiallahu anhu, look, take Abu Jahl's watch, give the rest of it back, just kind of poke him. No, he appointed Ali radiallahu anhu to return their belongings to them. That was expected of the Prophet and he went beyond the expectations. Everyone knew what the Prophet was like. Everyone knew what the Muslims were like. The Muslims had a behavior that they exhibited and so there's ihsan with Allah, there's ihsan with your family, there's ihsan with your community and there's ihsan from your community to the community around you. People should know better of Muslims. People should, should know that there are certain attributes, certain things about Muslims that are honorable and that are noble. They're not just the people that park their cars illegally on Salat al-Jum'ah and block our driveways. They're more than that. There are people that we love. There are people that we can trust. There are people that are honorable. And when you look at the life of the Prophet ﷺ, you find that Rasulullah ﷺ, some of the most beautiful ahadith about the Prophet ﷺ are when the Prophet ﷺ was offended, when he was insulted. Why? Because the more ugliness that's shown towards you, the more ihsan you should show. And I'll ask permission, Shaykh, can I just share one story, inshaAllah ta'ala? And it's the story of Zayd ibn Sa'na radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Zayd ibn Sa'na was one of the greatest Jews of Medina, the greatest rabbis of Medina. And he wanted to test the Prophet sallallahu So the Prophet sallallahu owed him some, some money, actually 20 kilograms of dates. And he came to the Prophet sallallahu in front of his companions three days before it was due. And he grabbed the Prophet sallallahu and he said, you people of Bani Hashim, you always cheat. You always wait to the last minute to pay. And he started to abuse the Prophet ﷺ and he was testing Rasulullah ﷺ. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he got up and he grabbed Zayd ibn Sa'na and he was about to, he was about to, to knock him out. <laughs> Frightened him. 
And Rasulullah he pulled Umar to the side and he said, this isn't what we wanted from you, Ya Ibn al-Khattab. You could have advised him to be kinder in asking for his debt. And you could have advised me to pay it earlier, to pay it with more ihsan. So he sent Umar radiallahu anhu with Zayd ibn Sa'na to give him 20 kilograms of dates. And he told him, give him an extra 20 because of the way you treated him. Allahu Akbar. So Umar radiallahu anhu is walking with him. And Zayd ibn Sa'na says, do you know who I am, O Umar? He says, no, I don't care. Says, I'm Zayd ibn Sa'na. Umar radiallahu anhu says, Habru al Yahud, the rabbi of the Jews, he says, yes. He says, then why did you act that way? It wasn't expected of you. You're a respected man. And he said, because there are two things I read about the Prophet to, be, to, to come, the foretold Prophet. I read about him, and yasbiqa hilmahu jahla, that his forbearance is greater than his anger. وَلَا يَزِيدَهُ جَهْلَ الْجَاهِلِينَ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا حِلْمَ And the more foolishness and anger you show towards him, the more his forbearance and his compassion will shine. And that's exactly what happens. And he said, أَشْهَدُوا أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ لَلَّهُ وَأَشْهَدُوا أَنَّ مُحَمَدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهُ The best hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ are the ones where he was offended. Because the more ugliness that's shown to you as an individual and as a community, the more ihsan we should show. And so the more ugliness that's shown to us right now by Islamophobes, the more our ihsan should shine in the society. And you know, the Prophet ﷺ, in my last concluding remarks, the Prophet ﷺ, one of my favorite ahadith from the Prophet ﷺ, actually comes when Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, you know, I used to say things to the Prophet ﷺ and it wouldn't get him mad. But she said, one time I said something to him and it really got him mad. She said, I said to the Prophet ﷺ, because I wasn't jealous of any of his wives like I was of Khadija radiallahu anha, even though she passed away, I didn't even see her. But he used to love her so much and talk about her so much and visit her grave and he would hear uh, the, the voice of her sister and say, Allah mahala, oh Allah it's hala, and he would send food to her friends. He loved her so much. So she said, one time I got jealous and I said, hasn't Allah exchanged that old woman from Quraysh with someone better than her? She said it to him straight up. Now, by the way, Aisha is the narrator of this hadith. She's telling us this so that we can learn from it. She's not, you know, people use these hadith to mock her, radiallahu anha, her mother, radiallahu anha. She's saying this to say, look, this is what I said to him. And she said, he got mad. The Prophet Sallallahu face turned red and the Prophet Sallallahu hair stood on his body. He was angry. You know what he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He says, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, Allah did not give me better than her. She believed in me when people disbelieved in me. She trusted me. She considered me truthful when others called me a liar. She spent on me when others did not spend on me. She gave me children. Allah gave me children through her and Allah did not give me children through others. How amazing is it that when the Prophet ﷺ was at his angriest and when the Prophet ﷺ's face turned red, he didn't say a single word of insult to Aisha radiallahu anha. He didn't say, you're not better than her because you're this and this and this and that. No, he responded with ihsan. The most beautiful hadith of the Prophet about Khadija radiallahu anha was when he was really, really, really mad. What does that show you? When ugliness is shown to you, show beauty to the people around you. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us a people that show ihsan with Allah, that show ihsan with our families, with, the, with our communities, with our spouses, that show ihsan with the non-Muslims, even with the Islamophobes, and that as a community show ihsan to those around us. We ask Allah to make us a community of excellence. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Sheikh Omar, for all of the insight you've provided us. Um, please just note there are, moder there are volunteers going through the aisles to pick up your questions, so just keep those in mind and jot down your thoughts on the cards that are being passed around. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Sheikh Abdul Nasser Jangda. He's the founder and director of Qadam Institute. He was born and raised in Dallas and went to Pakistan to memorize Quran at the age of 10, which he committed to memory in less than one year. After graduating from high school, he returned to Pakistan and completed the rigorous seven-year Adam course, where he graduated at the top of his class and with numerous ijazat in various Islamic sciences. He concurrently completed a BA and MA in Arabic from Karachi University and a master's in Islamic studies. He taught Arabic at the University of Texas, served as the Imam at the 
Polyville Masjid in Dallas for three years, is a founding member of Mansfield Islamic Center, and teaches with the Bayana Institute, where his class, entitled Meaningful Prayer, has traveled the world. Today, he will be building on what we just heard, um, and will specifically focus on the role of empathy, um, the ability to see the world from another person's perspective, and how that relates to our son. Please join me in welcoming Sheikh Abdul Nasser Jenka. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it's good to see everybody. Um, I know that the hall might not be as full as it was uh, before, but I was uh, observing and just kind of watching, uh, and I was really impressed by everybody and how much attention everybody was paying. Everybody really seemed to be dialed in, and that's more than what you can ask for, so really wanted to appreciate everybody for paying uh, uh, for paying attention and really trying to understand uh, what you know everyone is trying to communicate here from the stage. The topic of the session is radiating beauty. It's talking about the idea was that how Islam, whenever it went, wherever it went and whenever that was, the beauty that Islam radiated, the beauty that the Muslim community radiated, the 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 appeal that the Muslim community always had throughout history, throughout time. And when I, I really sat down and thought about this for a very long time, um, there were a lot of great suggestions, um, and I thought about it for a long time, what to talk about in this particular session, and it actually occurred to me la late last night or early this morning, um, that when I look at the Quran, when I look at the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I look at the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and one of the most powerful forces that you find in the Quran, that you find in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that jumps out at you and really draws you in. And when you study the history of Islam that you see that it pulled people in. It was like, you know, for a nerdy reference, it was like a tractor beam, right? Like it would grab people and would not let go of them. People seemed, you know, it's very interesting because on one side, obviously, the accusation from the disbelievers at the time of the Prophet ﷺ is that he's a sahir. He enchants people. He does, you know, he, he does some type of, he puts them under a spell. And that, of course, was false. But people really just completely um, were, people gravitated towards the Prophet ﷺ and they were not able to pull themselves away from him and what he presented. And when I thought about what was it about the Prophet ﷺ, what is it about Islam? And the Islamic manner and the Islamic lifestyle that had that effect on people throughout time, wherever Muslims went, I thought about an ayah of the Qur'an. This ayah is from the end of Surah Tawbah. And in this surah, surah number 9, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah says something really profound. At the end of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He introduces the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to us. And the introduction of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that Allah provides is something worth listening to. It's a very famous ayah, maybe you've heard of this before. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ I'm going to try to break this up into little bits and pieces. I'm going to try not to get too nerdy and try to analyze every single word. But uh, at the same time, I want you to appreciate what Allah is saying about the Prophet ﷺ. What Allah is communicating to us about the Messenger ﷺ for us to take note of and take home with us. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ Allah says that most definitely they, care, they came to you. Most definitely they came to you. Right off the bat, one thing that Allah tells us is that the messenger went to the people. He didn't wait for the people to come to him, but he went to the people. He knocked on their doors. He went and visited them. He sought them out. He looked for them. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ A messenger of all people. The highest station any human being can occupy is to be a messenger of God. To be, to be selected by Allah. To receive divine revelation and inspiration from God Himself. And so that man, he came to you. 
min anfusikum. And he was from amongst you. He was one of you. He grew up with you. He walked on the streets with you. He spoke your language. He knew who you were. He knew you by name. He asked, when he met you, he didn't just ask how you were doing. He asked you how your mom was doing. And how your father was doing. And how were your kids? And how was your wife? And how was your brother? And how was your uncle? He was from amongst you. Min anfusikum. And then comes the really powerful part. Azizun alayhi. Azizun alayhi. It is very harsh on him. It is very heavy on him. What is so heavy on him? What weighs on him? What weighs him down? Ma anittum. The difficulty that you experience is heavy on him. Think about that. The difficulty you experience is heavy on him. Harisun alaykum. Haris, the word hirs in the Arabic language is used for like greed. To want something, to desire something. It's like a very natural desire. Harisun alaykum. His natural default position was, want, was, was to want what was best for people. He is fully invested into your well-being. Bil mu'mineen, when it specifically comes to the believers, and this is a very subtle point here that I'd like to kind of touch on, but I don't want to talk on about this too much. There's a very weird dynamic we have, and a very bizarre understanding or implementation we have of what we call akhlaq or character, or as the Imam, the Sheikh was mentioning about ihsan. We have a very bizarre implementation or understanding of it. We do, we take akhlaq and ihsan and all these, these the good character and good manners and good disposition, right? We take all of that and we practice it with people that are on the outside of our lives. We practice it with strangers. We're very nice and polite. We hold doors open for people. We say please and thank you. Yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no sir. Right, we're very nice and polite and appropriate. Yes sister, thank you brother. Very, very nice. And then, but within our own home, we talk to each other like, like savages. Hey! Like what happened to all the politeness? Like one second, you'll see a guy, he'll be like, yes sister, how are you sister? Very good sister. And he'll turn to his wife, he's like, hey! And it's like, what just happened to you? What happened to the yes, hello, nice, thank you very much? What happened to that? Right? To other people's kids, we'll be like, oh, come here, how's it going, mashallah, he's so cute. Hey, stupid, come over here. It's like, what? Why would you talk to your own kid like that? Right? Or even within the community, we have this bizarre this 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 strange like application like dare I say that when we're at work or in a supermarket or at the mall we're very nice and polite and we'll let people go first but then when we're standing in line for food at the masjid we're like shoving people out of the way and we're being rude and obnoxious to other people right we'll pull out our phone and start talking stand, sitting right next to a guy who's like praying his sunnah is nawafil and we're like hey hey ha, ha, what's going on? like what's going on the guy's praying, right? So there's this very bizarre implementation. But the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bil mu'mineen? With the believers though? Who are the believers? Think about who the Sahaba were. The Sahaba were people who had pledged their life to the Prophet Sallallahu They would give up their lives for him. He didn't have to win them over. He had all, they were, they were already in. They were in. They weren't going nowhere. He didn't have to win them over. But specifically when it came to the believers, Ra'ufun Rahimun, ex extremely compassionate, always merciful. So this powerful comprehensive ayah is a very thorough introduction to who is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When I think about this though, and try to summarize this into an idea, the word that comes to my mind is empathy. That, that we are so distant from the idea of empathy, let alone the practice of it, that we don't sometimes even know what the word means. We know it sounds something kind of like sympathy. Sympathy is to understand where somebody else is coming from. To acknowledge somebody else's pain. Empathy is to feel their pain. To feel their pain. 
The Prophet ﷺ exhibited this beautiful, unbelievable quality of empathy. And I want to share very quick, rapid fire, so try to stay with me. I just want to share a couple of examples of this empathy in regards to different people. How he would practice his empathy with different people. It didn't matter who it was. The Prophet of Allah وسلم, when Ikrima, the son of Abu Jahl, Abu Jahl was the man who had declared war against the Prophet وسلم, the Muslims and Islam. He had killed Muslims just for believing. He had tortured Muslims just for believing. And he was at the head of multiple plots to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. He eventually led an army into the battlefield with the intent of killing the Prophet ﷺ and as many Muslims as possible. This man made it very clear what his position was in regards to the Prophet ﷺ and Islam. And eventually died with those same convictions. His son who had fought by the side of his father and in fact continued his father's work after his father's death. He is now coming to Mecca to meet the Prophet ﷺ after the conquest of Mecca. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he receives the news that Ikrima is, has entered Mecca and he's on his way to see you, the Prophet ﷺ turns to his companions and he says, his father's name was Amr bin Hisham and they used to call him Abu Hakam because he was a leader of his people. But the Muslims used to call him Abu Jahl because of his actions and his conduct. The Prophet ﷺ turned, he turns to the Muslims, the believers, and he says, Ikrima is coming, and I am hopeful that he will embrace and accept Islam. In his presence, none of you should refer to his father as Abu Jahl because it would hurt his feelings. Even if he becomes a Muslim and he recognizes that his father was wrong in his beliefs and his ideas and in what he did, it is still his father and it would hurt his feelings to hear people, his new brothers and sisters in faith, to refer to his father as the father of ignorance. So do not refer to him as Abu Jahl in the presence of his son Ikrima. This is the graciousness of the Prophet ﷺ. This is his empathy. He was able to put himself into Ikrimah's shoes and understand how he would feel in that situation. One of the main conspirators against the Prophet ﷺ, the head of the Munafiqun, the hypocrites, in Medina, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul. When his son comes to the Prophet ﷺ saying that my father has died, and I know that he was completely opposed to you. And he said terrible, reprehensible things about you. But he was my dad and I worry about him. The Prophet ﷺ on the spot removes his shirt. Takes off his own shirt. And he gives it to him and he says, wrap him in this. Use this as his shroud and bury him in that. What would we do to have the shirt of the Prophet ﷺ? Can you imagine being buried in the clothing of the Prophet ﷺ? What an honor. What a blessing. And it, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear, this would not forgive his sins and what he had done wrong. But the Prophet وسلم, at that time is thinking of the son and putting himself in the son's shoes. Imagine what he feels like losing his father. That's empathy. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very touching story. His grandson Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The son of Ali and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was the younger of the two brothers, Hassan and Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. May Allah be pleased with both of them. The younger one, he used to stutter. The younger one, he used to stutter. He had a very severe stutter to the point where he could not even complete a sentence. It would take him forever to finish a sentence. And what makes it even worse is as a child, this is very, very traumatic and very detrimental to the development of a child. What makes it even more difficult is the fact that the older brother, Hassan radiallahu anhu, was very, very eloquent and well-spoken and a very gifted public speaker. So think about the pressure that that put on the younger brother, stuttering so much. And so he used to stutter so much. And you know when kids start to get a little bit older, they're four or five years old, they start to develop a little bit of, you know, courage and they like to talk. One time, one time the Prophet ﷺ is sitting with quite a few companions and his grandsons are sitting with him and the younger one who stutters, he starts to chime in and say something. 
Because they love their grandfather. They're used to talking to him. He starts to say something. And the Prophet Sallallahu used to afford each and every person so much respect that when somebody would speak, he would become quiet. He would not just turn towards them with his face. He would turn towards them with his chest. And he would look at them while they spoke. And so he starts to speak, and the Prophet ﷺ stops and turns towards him. And so everybody there also starts to listen. And the kid is stuttering so badly that it starts to become awkward. And some of the people, naturally, not viciously, not maliciously, some of the people, naturally, they start to kind of exchange some glances, almost feeling bad for the kid. Because he cannot even get through a single sentence. It starts to get really kind of like awkward. And the Prophet ﷺ never once interrupts him. He does not finish his sentence for him. But the companions, they say, they looked at the face of the Prophet ﷺ on how is he reacting. And they said he had a big old smile on his face. And he was looking at Hussein ﷺ, who's smiling and listening to him quietly. He didn't care if it took five minutes for him to finish what he was saying. But he let him finish what he was saying. And when he was done finishing, when he was finished saying whatever he was saying, the Prophet ﷺ at that time turns to everybody else that is sitting there because everyone was so weirded and awkwarded out. He turns to everyone and he says, لَقَدَ وَرَثَهَا عَنْ عَمِّهِ مُوسَى He inherited this from his uncle Moses. Referring to Musa ﷺ and the fact that he used to stutter. That don't feel bad for him, envy him that he shares a trait with one of the great prophets of God, Musa alayhi salam. He turned that negative into a positive, putting himself in that child's shoes and realizing what he needed at that time. He needed love and support and acceptance for who he was, for wh wh however he was. And the last story about empathy that I'll share here is... A very touching story, Bashir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a companion of the Prophet ﷺ, he was an Ansari, he had gone out for one of the campaigns, the military expeditions. And when the, the Prophet ﷺ did not go on this particular journey, so when they would return back, he would go outside of Medina to welcome them back. And all the kids whose fathers had gone out, they would also go out there to welcome their fathers and their brothers and their uncles, etc. home. So they're out there and they're all waiting for people to come back. And as slowly everybody is coming back, and the Prophet ﷺ would wait and then he would come at the back of the army. He would be at the end watching over everybody, the shepherd. And the, the son of Bashir radiallahu ta'ala who is standing there, climbed up on a rock looking for his dad. And he sees people keep on coming. He keeps asking, have you seen my dad? Have you seen my dad? And he doesn't see his father. Finally, when he sees the Prophet ﷺ riding in the back, he realizes that means my father did not return. And he starts to cry. This child starts to cry because he realizes my dad isn't coming back home. He died. And the Prophet ﷺ stops. He's riding his animal. He stops. And he picks him up. And he hugs him. And he continues to hold him until he stops crying. He calms down. And then he says to him, he says, Ama tarda an akuna ana abak wa aisha ummak? Don't cry, don't worry. If you need a father, I will be your father from today, and Aisha will be your mother from today. To embrace somebody else's child as your own. Empathy. And look how it beautifies a person's conduct and character. How it beautifies a person. This quality is central to the prophetic character. And so when we talk about the beauty that Islam had and how Islam drew people in, it was through the beauty of Islam and the spirituality that Imam Umar talked about and the character and the akhlaq and the dealings of the Muslims. But centrally at the core of that is this idea of empathy, cultivating an attitude of empathy that will beautify our conduct. And when that begins to beautify our conduct, that will create that exemplary community that people will rush and flock to. Right now, people accept Islam in spite of us. It is solely the truth of Islam and the miracle of the Quran that people accept Islam. Then people will accept Islam actually because of us and due to us. Allah will make us the means and the sabab, but we have to qualify ourselves for that. And I'll finally end with just a really interesting thought. Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah ta'ala, a great scholar from the history of Islam, one of the great leaders of Muslims and the Summa, 
he saw he actually found out somebody informed him that one of his sons had purchased a ring worth a thousand dirhams a thousand silver coins like a thousand bucks he purchased a ring that cost a thousand dollars he called his son and he said I've heard that you bought a thousand dollar ring he said yes he said what I want you to do I want you to sell it take that money and go feed a thousand people and then just take one dollar buy a one dollar ring and inscribe on that ring Rahimallahu imra'an arafa qadra nafsihi may God have mercy on the man who recognizes and understands his limitation and his capacity our limitation in terms of who we are in our reality and our capacity to be able to care for others and to do good for others may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability uh, to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet sallallahu and his noble character which is Allah khairan assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah Thank you so much, Sheikh Dinda, for your insight. I'd like to welcome our final panelist for today, Ustada Zainab Ansari. She spent a decade studying Farsi, Arabic, and traditional Islam in the Middle East. She later volunteered, wrote, and taught for Sunni Path Academy. She's been a contributor to Seeker's Guidance, an online educational portal founded by Sheikh Faraz Rabbani, and taught at the Appalachian Retreat organized by the Muslim community of Knoxville. She's currently pursuing an MA in World History at Georgia State University after graduating with undergraduate degrees in History and Middle Eastern Studies. She recently joined the Taysir Foundation in Knoxville, Tennessee as a scholar in residence. She'll be taking our discussion in a fresh perspective. Uh, she'll be talking a bit about the role of Islam's artistic heritage in reviving and radiating beauty. Please join me in welcoming Ustada Zainab. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala sayyid al anbiya wal mursaleen Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Again, assalamu alaikum. I'm very honored to be standing here with you today and I want to thank the organizers of this wonderful convention. Please keep the organizers, the volunteers, the speakers, the guests in your dua. And also, please give a round of applause to ISNA for this wonderful convention. I have to ask Sister Iman and Imam Soheib and Sheikh Omar and Sheikh Abdul Nasser to please bear with me as I take this presentation in a slightly different direction. We're not going to have a lecture about art. You can look at books, there are presentations, you can take a course in Islamic art history. That's not what I'm here to discuss. My presentation, if you'll bear with me, is inspired by two points or two developments, recent developments. Number one, my talk is inspired by the Islamic State but not the one that you're thinking of. And number two, my talk is inspired by an esteemed public intellectual who called for greater candor in our discussions. Let me begin with this passage, and I invite you to reflect on these points. Muslims built sublime and comfortable architectural achievements decorated mosques and homes with graceful calligraphy of poetry and Quranic verses. Muslims bound books, illuminated manuscripts, and manufactured exquisite scents or fragrances to be shared between friends coming together for worship. Muslims living in an Islamic state composed poetry to be passed on sung and recited among others, prepared food to share with guests and family, wove beautiful geometric and floral carpets upon which to sit, and produced clothing, weapons, 
accoutrements, household furnishings, gardens, and fountains to live with. These things, these works of beauty, were not works of art, but rather artifacts, both utilitarian and graceful, by the grace of God. Their outer beauty came naturally of the inner beauty of the divine point of light. The beauty loved by Allah was that which reflected his own beauty in bestowing mankind a perfect religion of life. And this is composed by a very uh, well-known and respected scholar of the Islamic sciences, his reflection on beauty that I wanted to share with you, beauty and art. So going back to the inspiration for this talk, my inspiration is the Islamic State, but an Islamic state of heart, an Islamic state of mind that led generations of Muslim artisans and craftsmen and craftswomen to put forth the most wondrous works of art that you could possibly imagine. When I think of Islamic state, and please bear with me because I majored in history, I think about a civilization. I think about a way of organizing one's world wherein the concepts of Ihsan, of which our shuyukh spoke, translate very beautifully and seamlessly from the interior to the exterior. The question I have for us today is, Will the real Islamic State please stand? Dazzling, beguiling, majestic, awe-inspiring, sublime, transcendent, radiantly beautiful, that is the Islamic State that I know. A mere two to three centuries ago, just a blink of an eye in the divine time scale. This is how the world would have described the artistic output of the Islamic state, the Islamic polity. Islamic state would have meant something entirely different. It would have been a signifier for an entire community, a culture, an empire, a realm firmly rooted in Tawheed and monotheism an affirmation, a celebration, a recognition of the absolute uniqueness and oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifested in all his attributes of beauty and grandeur. Jamal and Jalal, the like of which there is no parallel. Again, speaking to today's events, will the real Islamic state please stand? not the mockery we witness today, not the travesty of justice masquerading as the Islamic State, not the baseless claim of a caliphate that no one in his or her right mind could possibly accept, not the resurrection of the Khawarij threat, not the dogs of hell that the Prophet ﷺ warned us would be unleashed on the Muslim world. Will the real Islamic State please stand? The civilization that gave to the world a radiantly beautiful book of divine guidance conveyed in the most beautiful medium possible, the human voice. The civilization that gave to the entire world the Dome of the Rock, forever a reminder of the time when prophets walked the earth and the idea that to pray was to be transported to the highest levels of heaven to worship Allah Ta'ala as if you see him, knowing that even if you don't see him, he surely sees you. Will the real Islamic state please stand? The civilization that gave to the world Alhambra a palace of Al-Andalus, and a beautiful place, the courtyard of the lions, a place where men split rocks, hewed them, carved them, and etched into them the very names of God, 
the beautiful names of God. Indeed, we could say that this inanimate rock seems to have more spirit than those posing today as the saviors of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, thumma qasat qulubukum min ba'di thalika fahiya kal hijarati aw ashaddu qaswa, wa inna min al-hijarati lama yatafajru minhu al-anhar, wa inna minha lama yashakaku fayakhruju minhu al-maa, وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا, لما يَهْبِطُ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ And yet, after all this, your hearts hardened and became like rocks, or even harder, because you know it's not a fair analogy, because as you well know, even rocks can split apart at the mere mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name. As the Qur'an says, for behold, there are rocks from which streams gush forth. And behold, there are some from which when they are split asunder, water pours forth. And behold, there are some that fall down for awe of God. And God, Allah, is not unmindful of what you do. So my plea today is to understand that representation is very powerful, that Islam, from its inception, at its core, was about radiating beauty. A beauty that began with inward ihsan, excellence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and translated into a culture, a community and civilization that put forth the most beautiful works of art imaginable. Works of art that brought together the transcendent, and the human, and reminded us of our ultimate destiny and journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, will the real, the beautiful, the radiantly beautiful Islamic state please stand? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you, Ustada Zainab. Um, we're going to go ahead and move right into the questions. So please do pass your questions to the volunteers if you have any. I have a few to start with. Um, and I'll let whoever uh, choose whoever would like to answer. Um, so the first question says, sometimes the perfection of the Prophet's ways was so great that when I try to practice his ways, I become overwhelmed and then frustrated when I fail. I feel that certain traits cannot change. What can one do? Um, so I want to come the question about how do you change your ways you know, look, when we talk about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we talk about the Sahaba, um, one of the mistakes that we make many times is that we, we fail to remember that they were human beings that walked and that talked and that had families and that had moments of anger and had moments of happiness, moments of dispute, moments of re reconciliation, all of these things that we encounter. When you look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, and this was... Um, some of you might know, and, and this is not a shameless plug, and I actually want to say this, that we recently produced something called Inspiration, the Inspiration series, which is bringing the seerah to your actual everyday life, to actually reform your own ethics in accordance with the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because usually every Islamic YouTube video is uh, a guy getting in a car, smiling, happy, and then car accident, then surat qaf, and then it's over. <laughs> Death. I realize I should have done better, it's over. Whereas when we look at the Prophet ﷺ, look, we cannot be as perfect as the Prophet ﷺ was. But we should strive. Allah Azza wa says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُوا لَنَا That those who strive in our path, we will guide them to our ways. In essence, you don't become kind overnight. You practice smiling. You practice patience. You practice patience with the very small things in life in hopes that you'll be able to maintain patience 
with very big things in life, with tragedy and, and calamities that strike you later on in life. You practice forbearance with a flat tire and with a person who looks at you the wrong way at a restaurant or wherever it is. And that way, when you get into it, when, when you're provoked and you're in a, in, a, in a situation where your anger really could get the best of you, you remember the Prophet them, and you're able because you've practiced that forbearance to hold on to that forbearance at that time. Rasulullah he says, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلُّمْ وَإِنَّمَا الْحِلْمُ بِالتَّحَلُّمْ He said alayhi salatu wasalam, that verily knowledge is through seeking knowledge and forbearance, al-hilm, which I talked about in my lecture a lot. I chose to focus on that because I knew Shaykh Abdul Nasser was going to talk about empathy. And so I just wanted to kind of introduce that. Hilm, forbearance, is the most difficult trait to, to earn. It's very hard to go from being hot-tempered to being patient and having forbearance. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Hilm, the quality of forbearance, is attained through practicing forbearance. Patience is attained through practicing patience, the same way knowledge is attained by sitting down and learning hadith after hadith, ayah after ayah, so on and so forth. And so it takes time, it takes practice. So no, you don't just burn, you know, crash and burn uh, when you don't meet the standards that you initially set for yourself, especially if it's the standard of the Prophet ﷺ, you instead keep practicing, just as what you do in school. You don't drop out of school every time you fail a test, right? You don't quit. Just as you're learning and you're seeking knowledge, you're seeking good morals. And Rasulullah says, وَمَنْ يَتَحَرَّ الْخَيْرَ يُعْطَى وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ الشَّرَّ يُوْقَى And whoever seeks out a good quality, Allah eventually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will eventually unlock it for them. And whoever seeks to avoid an evil, Allah will protect them from that evil. So it's a very beautiful method that the Prophet is giving to us in that regard. You want to add to that? Next question, are there situations when we're allowed to react toughly to people, where kindness might not be the most appropriate uh, reaction, maybe it makes them more ignorant, the questioner asks, so, he, so they're asking if there's situations where kindness may not actually be the best way to react. So um, before I answer the question, I promised a friend I was going to say go balls. Uh, but um, if you didn't understand what that is, don't worry about it. It's not for you. Um, but are there situations where you're allowed to react kind of toughly or harshly with people? Um, the answer is yes. Right? Each situation is based on its circumstances. And, you know, there are varying scenarios. There are varying situations. No two situations are completely the same. And remarkably, even though the default position of the Prophet ﷺ was of mercy and forgiveness and forbearance, there were circumstances where the Prophet ﷺ did choose. They were rare. They were far and few in between. But there were circumstances where the Prophet ﷺ chose to hold somebody accountable for their actions. So it really just depends on the situation scenario. Uh, I, I don't know if this was part of the questioner's, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, concern, but I do know that a lot of people, when we talk about these types of qualities like forbearance and forgiveness and compassion and mercy and forgiveness, etc., sometimes some uh, uh, some people might get the incorrect notion that being offended by something, being bothered by something, is somehow wrong or sinful. That's not what's in question here. Be getting upset by something is not problematic. Imam Shafi ta'ala says, uh, somebody who never gets upset by anything, somebody who never feels any anger, is no longer a human. That person is now a donkey. Right? Because that person has no feelings, no sensitivities, doesn't care. You will be upset by things. You will be bothered by things, but it's how do you channel those emotions? What do you do with that situation? As he just mentioned that you practice patience. You practice forbearance in that scenario. Um, so there are situations that might be warranted where you can act toughly. You know, the Prophet ﷺ gives us a very, you know, our religion has a very comprehensive uh, advice in this regard. How do you know how to handle yourself in any given situation? There are a couple of steps to take. Number one, like the Prophet ﷺ says, istafti qalba. Check your heart. Your heart will tell you quite a bit about what you think you should do in that situation. Number one. 
Number two, seeking shriwa, seeking counsel, seeking advice is a part of our Islamic procedure as well. Talk to somebody, get some advice, go to your imam, go to you know, your, your parents, go to a trusted you know, confidant, go to get advice from somebody, uh, go to a teacher and get some advice. And thirdly and finally, even look within the deen and the religion. Is there a precedent for this in the life of the Prophet Does Islam tell me anything about it? And that's how you'll know how to handle any given situation. But summarily speaking, so it's hard to kind of answer the question very, uh, to give any details, but generally speaking, there might be a situation that might warrant handling things a little bit more, you know, being a little bit more tough in the situation, handling things a little bit more hands-on, um, and holding somebody accountable for their behavior or their actions, there might be very likely a situation that requires that. I just add on to that, that the hadith of Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Aisha radiallahu anha as well, وَمَنْ تَقَمَ لِنَفْسِهِ قَتْ He never got angry for himself, but when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's boundaries were crossed, يَنْتَقِمُ لِلَّهِ He would get angry for Allah. What that tells you is even in, this, in, the, in the incident that I mentioned with Aisha radiallahu anha, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa got angry for, the, for Khadija radiallahu anha. It wasn't for himself. And what I always tell people, you know how you want to gauge your anger, whether it's for Allah or it's for yourself? The adab of your anger and the way that it comes out when you express your anger is very telling of its intention. Why? Because again, if you're getting angry for Allah, then you're not going to do anything in your anger that's going to contradict what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered you to do and that Allah azza wa jal has legislated. The ethics of your anger will also be governed by the shara' because your anger was for Allah in the first place. And so when people get really angry about stuff and especially, you know, now uh, on, in the online world, everyone, every, you know, they're called outrage trolls. <laughs> get angry about everything that happens in the world. But then when it's littered with personal attacks and, and bad adab and things of that sort and su'al khuluq, bad manners, then that shows that the anger is not for Allah and the anger is not for those people. You're manipulating, you're hijacking a cause. And so it's important that your anger is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you don't do anything in your anger to contradict the legislation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you. There, there's quite a few questions about difference. So how is, it, how is the best way that we can handle difference um, with Ihsan? So some of the context that it comes up, um, someone asks about different people from different schools of thought. Um, there's a question about MSAs and having differences of opinion within the MSA, but also more specifically with the background of students that are coming in. Um, people coming in from overseas versus people born and raised here, uh, political differences. So that's that's kind of um, a lot of different a lot of different ways in being different. But I think the overall question is what is the best way to deal with it um, in a beautiful manner. Jazakallah khair. This is um, the question is interesting. I think I want to focus more on the aspect of um, how to negotiate difference within the environment of a college campus. And this is something that we uh, discussed last night um, at the MSA panel um, where, where, the, where we kind of had sort of open dialogue and um, concerns came up about how to create an MSA that's more inclusive um, of Muslims, especially those who might be less practicing. But as far as this overall issue of difference, I, we have to then look to Islam sources. And that's why when I received the topic for today's session, it really paralyzed me in a way that none of the other topics did, this word beauty. I mean, it just really gripped me because I'm like, subhanAllah, if you think about just do free association between the terms Islam or Islamic State today, are, do, do those terms evoke images and representations and acts of beauty? And it made me extremely upset because I had to say to myself, no. No, just the other day I went somewhere and someone asked me to please explain what's going on in Iraq with this, with this particular group. So my contention is that the genius of Islamic civilization has always resided in the fact that Muslims were able to sort of uh, implement um, an ethics of difference, respectful disagreement, right? I mean, there's such an amazing precedence for this when we look at Islamic intellectual history and the development of the various schools of law, etc. So 
my point is, is that in that particular college campus environment where you have a number of groups competing for students' attention, it's an environment that basically sort of celebrates notions of tolerance and inclusion and pluralism, that Muslim students have an opportunity to demonstrate this, eth this, 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 this ethics of, of disagreement, um, both within the MSA and also in their interactions with, 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 with the other groups on campus, that by the very nature of the organization, you're going to have debate and dispute, and you're going to have people within the organization who might have differing visions, and you're definitely going to have people outside of the organization that are going to, that are going to challenge you. And what you have to do is rise to the occasion. Look at the example of the ulama, for example, in the past, you know, how they would concede that possibly their position might be wrong. I mean, they, they allowed for the possibility of being mistaken, for example. They were humble. And we need to really try to internalize that. There's no way that one can defend the Quran and Sunnah, but also be arrogant to people at the same time. And I'll share this anecdote with you. This is an experience that happened to the MSA, where um, a group came to campus, and their argument was that um, an openly homosexual life was uh, compatible with Islam. And the MSA took issue with that. However, we really, really, really squandered an opportunity to manifest beautiful adab, right? And a proper ethics of, of, of disagreement and, and resolving dispute. In defense of the Quran and Sunnah, you had members of, of our organization heckling the speaker, um, cursing, literally cussing the speaker out, um, making obscene gestures at the speaker. Campus police had to be called. So instead of having a discussion about this very sensitive topic and demonstrating that we could disagree with their position, yet have adab, yet be dignified, the emotions were just all over the place and everybody was left sadly with a very poor impression of the Muslim Students Association. So as you negotiate difference, think about the legacy that you want to leave behind. You want it to be a legacy of beauty and ihsan and excellence and not the opposite. So Stadith, I may just ask a follow-up to that. Um, that's very interesting. I, I'm, I'm curious as to why, um, so I'm, I'm thinking about something that Professor Jackson said last night in the lecture, and he was, he was talking about how if you look at our scholarly tradition, um, you could be reading a text and you are so convinced by the argument that the scholar is giving and then you arrive at the end and he says hada batlat and he goes on to say this is not actually my opinion but I'll give you I'll give you what I actually think um, the idea being that there was so much respect of difference of opinion and there was so much fairness and objectivity in how we deal with that in the past so I'm wondering why, um, what do you think changed? <laughs> why do we struggle so much with this today? SubhanAllah, that is a very um, complicated question, but what I will say to address that as far as how Muslims departed from that particular sort of adab of, uh, of uh, ikhtilaf, of, of, of scholarly dispute and disagreement is that the discourse on Islam in many ways these days is, is both kind of shaped and sort of, um, it's shaped by, by the lay person. And what I mean by that is that, you know, as, our, as Sheikh Omar said, the internet has given people a platform and sadly they're using this platform to sort of attack others with whom they disagree, um, presenting themselves as sort of experts on Islam when Allahu alam if they even have had basic training in Islamic sciences. So I think part of the issue is that, you know, ulama with the proper qualifications and training are not really having this discussion anymore. It's being sort of dominated by people who are very vocal, but, don't but do not necessarily have the tools to really address and grapple with these issues. And then another aspect of it is that sadly, we've taken methodological approaches to Islam, madhab and, and uh, manhaj and, and these sorts of sort of identifiers, right? So school of thought and one's methodology and school of law and Sufi and Salafi and all these different terms. And we've turned it into this identity politics thing 
which is absolutely ridiculous. I remember when my mom became Muslim, you know, her, uh, the first question that she asked the brother that gave her shahada was, do I have to call myself Shafi'i or Hanafi or this or that? Can I just be Muslim? And he was like, of course. So sadly, you know, we've taken these labels and we've made these labels paramount as opposed to contextualizing them as just various sort of approaches to negotiating these classical texts, right? So we have left out the sort, we've, we've, we've it, it's really interesting, so it's sort of like we've, we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. We don't understand that, you know, that these signifiers are the result of centuries of robust debate and discussion amongst their ulama. They're not meant to be used as sort of um, labels in a bully pulpit to frankly kind of harangue each other with. I was just saying that the word is cliques. They're like fraternities now. And really, people act like frat boys within these different groups and these different labels. And SubhanAllah, I mean, really, at the end of the day, I think each one of these movements even needs to reanalyze itself because if, if your movement is failing to create critical thinkers and free thinkers, then it's a failed movement at the end of the day as well. And these labels need to be shed and people need to be free thinkers that, that not free from the ulama, that's not what I'm, but free from these labels and free from this, these identities. And, and be more principled because I feel like people will sacrifice their principles, sacrifice their integrity to make sure that they're in line with their frat. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us and to, and to allow us to be just Muslims. I think we have, we have time for one last question and then uh, we'll go ahead and close the session. Um, to get very practical here, uh, I think we're often tested when it comes to children <laughs> in keeping um, ihsan. So the questioner asks, how do you deal with disobedient children when you've tried your very best? Um, and then I'm also, one of my jobs as a moderator is to close with a dua, um, but someone has already asked for a dua, a dua to increase our ihsan. So if maybe one of you can close with a dua and the other, um, treat this question about children. You know, I believe that all of us here are parents, so I, th I would honestly like to hear from our shiuk how they feel about this. SubhanAllah, I mean, Allah Ta'ala has, to has told us in the Quran that in our children there is a test for us, right? Um, so a child that's disobedient and a parent that's frustrated, how to handle? You know, in a nutshell, all I can say is look at the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's, you know, absolutely zero evidence that he ever sort of harshly punished a child, no matter how misbehaved that child or disruptive that child might have been. So the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was always restraint and being halim, being sort of forbearing. You know, he never, he didn't criticize, he didn't nitpick, um, and he didn't belittle. And, you know, I think that really it's an instances with a sort of a child that's just kind of headstrong or stubborn that one really has to be able to model because ultimately you are that child's role model. They are learning from you. You are setting an example for that child in the way that you react and interact with him or her. So just look at the example of the Prophet wasallam, and there are practical strategies, you know, as far as how curbing your anger, making wudu, you know, leaving the room, giving the, ch you know, handing the child off to, um, to the other parent, making dua for the child. Don't ever fall into the mistake of making dua against the child. Always make dua for the child. And understand that this child, this, this person is an amana for whom we are responsible. Um, you know, and then I, I have a child on the autism spectrum, and there have been very frustrating moments. And honestly, Quran and dhikr and salawat have been so, so, so healing in those moments. I would really say make sure you always have Quran, especially Al-Baqarah, playing throughout the house. That is tremendously helpful. The one thing that I would say is that make sure that you establish a basic premise that your child knows that your criticism is coming from a place, a place of love and not a place of authority. And so what I've seen, subhanAllah, is that a lot of times, and this is not to justify the disobedience of the child, but a lot of times it becomes parents that are just trying to enforce as much power as possible to say that you will listen to me because you have to, and children that are saying, I'm growing up now and I will not listen to you, I don't have to anymore. And in essence, the entire subject of the, of, of the dispute uh, is no longer relevant. 
to the argument in the first place. So I think just trying to enforce, having those heart-to-hearts that, look, my, my telling you this is coming from a place of love. It's not coming from a place of, of authority or a place of, I'm not trying to, to, you know, to hinder your growth or to take away from your personality or your character or your happiness. So just trying to establish that in any way that you can, inshallah ta'ala, I think helps. When it, when it comes to disciplining children as well, there's just, there's also, it, it depends on the approach of the parent as well. And you have to kind of assess your own strengths and weaknesses, the personality of the child as well. Uh, personally, my method of disciplining my children is to give them ice cream. Uh, I just don't know what to do. I'm just this, uh, I'm the sappy one. My wife is the one who actually kind of brings a little bit more structure. But I understand that about myself. Um, another thing that's also very, very important, and this is actually very problematic, is that before you discipline your child for messing up or doing something wrong, what you need to ask yourself is, did you actually even explain or teach the child that this was unacceptable behavior? You, and that might seem like common sense, but you wouldn't believe how common it is for a child to be disciplined for something that the parent actually never even clearly, plainly ever told the child that by the way, this is not something you should do. And then so then you're disciplining them for something that they didn't even know something was wrong. So there's actually more responsibility and onus. We love to talk about the authority of parenthood, but the responsibility of parenthood needs a lot more emphasis in our community. Um, and so that's just uh, what I would really emphasize. We ask Allah to help us in incorporating all of the insights today that we've, that we've gained. Please join me in thanking Chef uh, Jengda, Chef Suleiman, and Ustad Zainab Ansari. And please don't forget to pass up your evaluation forms before you head out. Welcome to the 51st Annual ISNA Convention. Generations Rise, elevating Muslim American culture. Assalamu alaikum. Just a reminder that the next session will begin in about 10 or 15 minutes.